Welcome to the tugboat physics secrets every boater wants to know. Those stubby little boats that somehow boss around ships the size of skyscrapers. Picture this, a little tugboat, barely bigger than your weekend cruiser, casually nudging a 1,000-foot container ship that weighs 200,000 tons through a channel narrower than a football field. But here's what nobody tells you. These maritime bulldogs are actually exploiting hydrodynamic principles that most people never learn about, using mechanical advantage in ways that would make Archimedes proud. They're harnessing physics at its principles, generating power that seems mathematically impossible, and performing maneuvers that traditional naval mechanics said couldn't be done. Today, we're diving deep into the engineering mastery that makes these David and Goliath battles possible every single day. Let me blow your mind with something that'll make you rethink everything you know about boats. Your average harbor tugboat we're talking about something maybe 80 to 100 feet long, is packing anywhere from 2,000 to 5,000 horsepower. To put that in perspective, that's more power than three Dodge Challenger Hellcats combined, crammed into a boat that looks like it was designed by someone's drunk uncle. But here's where it gets truly bonkers. The newest escort tugs protecting oil tankers in places like Prince William Sound are pushing 8,000 to 10,000 horsepower. That's the equivalent of 10 Corvette Z06s trying to escape from a boat, smaller than most people's backyards. The Voith Schneider propulsion systems on some of these beasts can generate thrust in any direction instantaneously, and I mean any direction. We're talking about a boat that can move laterally at full power without changing heading. It's like if your car could suddenly decide to crab walk sideways into a parallel parking spot at highway speeds. These cycloidal propellers look like industrial egg beaters, with vertical blades that rotate around a vertical axis, while also oscillating to create thrust vectors that would make an aerospace engineer jealous. Now, here's something controversial that'll ruffle some feathers in the maritime community. Most tugboat captains will tell you horsepower is everything, but the dirty little secret is that bollard pull, the actual static pulling force measured in tons, is what really matters, and the relationship isn't linear. I've seen 3,500 HP tugs with 50 tons of bollard pull outperform 5,000 HP boats with 45 tons because of propeller efficiency and nozzle design. It's all about how you convert that power to usable thrust, not just raw engine output. Speaking of engines, let's talk about what's actually creating all this chaos. Most modern tugs run Caterpillar 3512 or 3516 series engines. EMD 645 or 710 series, yes, locomotive engines adapted for marine use, or if you're dealing with the European market, Varsila W26 or MAN 175D engines that could power a small town. These aren't your weekend warrior's boat motors. We're talking about engines weighing 15 to 30 tons, with individual cylinder displacements bigger than most car engines. If you're finding this as mind-blowing as I did when I first learned about it, hit that subscribe button and ring the bell, because what's coming next about hull design is going to completely change how you look at these floating workhorses. Trust me, the engineering gets even more fascinating. Here's where tugboat design gets genuinely controversial, and I'm about to upset some old-school mariners. For about a hundred years, everyone believed tugboats needed deep, narrow hulls for stability. Then in the 1980s and 90s, naval architects like Robert Allen Limited in Vancouver said, let's rethink this entirely, and created the sponsored hull designs with much wider beams that completely revolutionized the industry. These new hulls feature beam-to-length ratios of nearly 3 to 1. Imagine a bulldozer that floats. The naval architecture behind this is actually counterintuitive as hell. A wider beam gives you greater initial stability through increased water plane area, sure, but it also means you're pushing more water aside. So how do these beamy boats work better? It's all about the writing moment, the force trying to return the boat to vertical when healed. 
By spreading the buoyancy horizontally and keeping the vertical center of gravity low with engines mounted on resilient mounts, these wide boats can work at heel angles up to 30 degrees that would capsize a traditional narrow hull, generating lateral forces through their underwater geometry. But here's the part nobody discusses at IMO conferences. These wide beam escort tugs can experience dangerous interaction forces in certain conditions. When you're working alongside a massive tanker doing 10 knots, the Bernoulli effect between the two hulls creates a pressure drop that can generate suction forces exceeding 20 tons. I've interviewed captains who've had their boats pulled completely against a ship's hull despite full opposing thrust, creating impact forces that have blown out wheelhouse windows. The manufacturing process for these specialized hulls is equally impressive. Shipyards like Robert Allen Design, Darman Shipyards, and Bollinger Shipyards are using six-axis robotic welding systems, laying down perfect beads on steel plates ranging from 12 to 50 millimeters thick. The precision required is remarkable. We're talking about maintaining tolerances within 2 mm on structures weighing hundreds of tons. One miscalculation in the hull's hydrodynamic lines can create resonant frequencies that'll cause destructive vibration at specific shaft speeds. Alright, let's talk about the mechanical wizardry of tugboat maneuvering, because this is where engineering gets properly innovative. Traditional vessels steer by deflecting water flow across a rudder. Straightforward physics. Modern tugs said that's too limiting and adopted Z drive as a moving thrusters that can rotate through 360 degrees continuously. Imagine if your car's entire drivetrain could rotate beneath it while maintaining full power. That's essentially what these boats achieve. Except they're doing it with 4,000 horsepower, spinning stainless steel propellers weighing several tons. The court nozzle, that's the ducted shroud surrounding the propeller, increases static thrust by 25% to 40% at bollard pull conditions. It's exploiting the acceleration of water mass through a restricted area. The nozzle's airfoil shape accelerates water velocity through the propeller disc, while reducing tip vortices, creating additional forward thrust from the nozzle itself. It's applying the same Bernoulli principle that generates lift on aircraft wings, except we're doing it underwater with what looks like a giant steel funnel welded to the hull. Working in confined waters is where these boats really demonstrate their capabilities. In Fort Lauderdale's New River, for instance, tugboat captains are navigating 90-foot vessels through the downtown section, where the navigable channel narrows to just 125 feet, with multi-million dollar yachts moored within feet on both sides. The hydrodynamic challenge here involves the bank effect. When operating near a wall or parallel vessel, the accelerated flow between creates a pressure differential, inducing both suction toward and a turning moment away from the obstruction. Expert captains actually utilize these forces, positioning their vessels to ride the pressure gradients for station keeping without excessive power usage. Team coordination presents complex vector mathematics. When three or four tugs work a large vessel, they're creating a distributed thrust system requiring real-time coordination. One tug applies force at the bow, while another works the quarter, generating turning moments measured in thousands of ton-meters. The calculations involved require considering multiple variables simultaneously. Thrust vectors, vessel momentum, hydrodynamic resistance, wind forces, and current effects, or while maintaining safe working tensions on the lines. Now if you think that's impressive, wait until you hear about the lethal physics of tugboat lines that cause more maritime casualties than any other equipment on these vessels. But first, if you're learning something new here, drop a comment below about what surprised you most so far. And make sure you're subscribed, because the danger factor is about to escalate dramatically. This is where I'm going to get serious for a minute, because what I'm about to tell you represents one of the most significant hazards in tugboat operations, and most people outside the industry have no awareness of the risk. When a tugboat's working line, whether ultra-high molecular weight polyethylene, UMHWPE, rope or steel wire, is under load, it's storing elastic potential energy proportional to the square of the applied tension. A 3-inch diameter UHMWPE line under 150 tons of load stores approximately 500,000 joules of potential energy. When these lines fall apart, and material failure does occur, they recoil at velocities that can exceed 500 feet per second. 
The momentum transfer from a parting line has been measured at forces exceeding 50 tons instantaneously. Maritime accident investigations have documented fatalities from line strikes, and the injury patterns are severe. The snapback zone on a tugboat's working deck is designated based on calculated recoil trajectories, and experienced crews understand these zones represent extreme hazard areas. Here's the material science that makes this so dangerous. Synthetic lines like Spectra or Dyneema have a modulus of elasticity, allowing 3-4% elongation at working load. When that stored elastic energy releases catastrophically, it converts to kinetic energy following the equation Ke equals half mv squared. Because the line has relatively low mass compared to stored energy, the resulting acceleration can exceed 1000 g. The forces involved exceed human tissue's tensile strength by orders of magnitude. The industry debate centers on synthetic versus steel wire rope safety profiles. Synthetic lines offer better handling characteristics and lower weight, but exhibit sudden failure modes with minimal warning. Steel wire provides visible degradation indicators, broken wires, corrosion, deformation, but creates different hazards, including higher mass and potential for traumatic injury from recoil. It's essentially choosing between failure modes, not eliminating risk. Contemporary tugboats are implementing engineering controls, including snapback arrestor systems and remote winch operation stations. But here's the economic reality. Retrofitting existing vessels with comprehensive safety systems can cost $250,000 per vessel. Many operators defer these upgrades until regulatory compliance mandates installation, despite the documented risk reduction. Let me tell you about Port Everglades and Fort Lauderdale's tugboat operations. Because these mariners are executing maneuvers with tolerances measured in inches, the New River's downtown section presents a navigational challenge. Five bascule bridges, bidirectional tide currents reaching three knots, and yacht facilities with vessels valued at $100 million packed into every available berth. Tugboat captains here are transiting 200-foot yachts through passengers with literally inches of clearance. Using hydrodynamic effects, most captains would consider hazards. The shallow water hydrodynamics in these channels create what's called squat effect. When a vessel moves through water depths less than 1.5 times its draft, the accelerated flow beneath the hull creates a pressure reduction, causing the vessel to sink lower and potentially ground. Fort Lauderdale tugboat captains have developed techniques using calculated speeds to ride the pressure wave they generate, maintaining precise control while compensating for the reduced under-keel clearance. Then consider the Netherlands maritime operations, where tugboats at facilities like Lursen, Hersen, and Arnold's are repositioning super yachts during construction phases. These vessels, often without operational systems, require dead ship moves through Dutch canals with minimal clearance. The precision achieved using differential GPS positioning and laser ranging systems maintains tolerances within 5 cm, while controlling displacement exceeding 2,000 tons. Here's cutting-edge technology. Dutch tugboat operations now employ augmented reality interfaces. Captains use head-mounted displays showing real-time force vectors, predicted trajectories, and proximity alerts overlaid on their visual field. The computational requirements, processing LiDAR data, GPS positioning, and force calculations in real time would have required mainframe computers in the recent past. The physics engines running these systems calculate hydrodynamic interactions using Navier-Stokes equations simplified for real-time processing. Panama Canal locomotive-assisted transits represent another operational extreme. These passages require maintaining position within the 110-foot wide locks versus 116-foot beam for new Panama X vessels, leaving 24-inch total clearance. The turbulent flow patterns created by 26 million gallons of water movement generate complex vortices and cross currents. Tugboat masters must counteract these forces continuously throughout the 8 to 10 hour transit, maintaining thrust vectors that prevent contact while the vessel settles and rises through each chamber. Here's where I'm going to clarify a fundamental distinction that even many maritime professionals confuse. Tugboats and towboats represent entirely different vessel categories optimized for distinct operational profiles. 
and their operators view each other with the rivalry of submariner versus surface fleet sailors. Tugboats are designed for ship assist and escort duties, typically 65 to 120 feet length with length-to-beam ratios around 3.5 to 1, deep draft for stability, and power densities exceeding 50 horsepower per tons of displacement. Towboats operate on inland waterways, ranging 50 to 200 feet in length, with squared bows for barge interface, shallow draft for river navigation, and lower power densities around 20 to 30 HP per ton, since they operate in steady-state pushing mode rather than dynamic maneuvering. The hull architectures differ fundamentally. Towboats utilize flat-bottom designs with minimal dead rise for shallow river navigation and tunnel sterns protecting propellers from grounding. They'd prove completely inadequate for harbor work, lacking the maneuverability and stability for alongside operations. Tugboats with their round bilges and deep skegs would suffer continuous grounding damage attempting Mississippi River towboat operations. It's comparing specialized tools, neither superior, both essential for their designed purpose. River towboat operators typically work rotation schedules, 28-14 or 21-21 days on off, with predictable routes and consistent crews. Harbor tugboat crews work on demand schedules with variable assignments and port calls. Compensation structures differ significantly. Towboat operators often earn steady salaries, while tugboat crews may receive voyage bonuses. Each group considers their specialization more demanding, creating entertaining debates at maritime labor conferences. The next evolution in tugboat technology will transform operational capabilities beyond current limitations. Wartzilla and Kongsberg Maritime are testing autonomous tugboats using machine learning algorithms processing thousands of operational scenarios. Initial trials in Copenhagen and Singapore demonstrate these systems can execute birthing operations, with precision exceeding human operators in controlled conditions. Battery electric propulsion is revolutionizing tugboat capabilities. Electric motors deliver maximum torque from zero RPM eliminating turbo lag and providing instantaneous response. The E-Wolf in Rotterdam uses a 2,784 kilowatt-hour battery bank delivering 2,800 kilowatts, 3,755 horsepower, with response times under 100 milliseconds from command to full thrust. The torque curves of electric propulsion allow precision control, impossible with diesel engines requiring RPM buildup for power delivery. Understanding tugboat physics isn't just about appreciating maritime engineering. It's recognizing the critical infrastructure enabling global commerce. Every container ship delivering goods, every cruise ship bringing tourists, every tanker supplying energy depends on these vessels and their crews executing precision maneuvers with minimal error margins measured in centimeters and consequences measured in millions. The next time you observe a tugboat operating, looking utilitarian and purposeful, remember you're witnessing one of the most sophisticated applications of applied hydrodynamics and mechanical engineering in the maritime sector. It's a floating demonstration of physics principles, where theoretical calculations meet practical application at thousands of horsepower, and where mathematical precision prevents catastrophic failures. If you made it this far and learned something new about these remarkable vessels, do me a favor and hit that subscribe button. Ring the notification bell too, because I've got more maritime engineering revelations coming that'll fascinate you just as much. Drop a comment below about what surprised you the most. Was it the snapback physics, the omnidirectional propulsion, or discovering that tugboats are essentially solving complex physics problems in real time? And if you know someone who thinks tugboats are just cute little helper boats, share this video with them and watch their perspective change completely. Until next time, keep your lines secure and your calculations accurate.